Welcome to the Tapestry of Life. I am Dr. Pascal Scholes, Professor of Behavioral Health and Human Services at Community College of Philadelphia. Today's topic is ODAT, a multi-purpose center in Philadelphia. ODAT, one day at a time, is dedicated to serving low-income and homeless men and women and their families in the Philadelphia area with behavioral health challenges and HIV AIDS. AIDS. Reverend Henry T. Wells founded ODAP in 1983. In 1993, Reverend Wells and ODAP began ministering to the homeless living in Crate City, a community of homeless individuals and families living in cardboard boxes in the corridors of Philadelphia's subways. Today, it is a multi-purpose center living in the real world. It continues to serve thousands of residential clients annually, and its facilities supply recovery, addiction, and homeless shelter services. To discuss this topic today, I want to welcome back my special co-host, Rick Ford from DBH, and our two very special guests, Mel Wells, president of ODAT, and Daryl Chapman, ODAT alumni and employer, if I'm not mistaken. I think you do work with uh, a lot of the people in the program. Correct. Well, let's get started by saying, one, I'm very familiar with your agency. Uh, I, I kind of joke about it sometimes because it's in my old neighborhood. I, okay. I grew up at the 22nd in Indiana and, you know, near Connie Mack Stadium, so I know the kind of the general neighborhood, and I actually have made uh, a few visits to your agency over mm -hmm. the years from the behavioral health program. We were putting students into it, and I, I must say that the, the multi-purpose issue is, is so critical, and mm -hmm. as you know, your, your father was mm -hmm. so well known as mm -hmm. a person who mm -hmm. did such wonderful work. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. don't know if you want to start with maybe a little bit about the, the service and... Well, I'd like to start with just speaking about Reverend Wells, because yes. without Reverend Wells, we couldn't be here today. The sure. organization wouldn't be here. The reason why Reverend Wells, uh, he actually did one day at a time because number one, he believes it's a God sent program. Uh, number two, he had a strong woman standing behind him and that was my mother. But my father had no high school education. He really had nothing except God. So dad wanted to start this organization just to let everybody know that you can go ahead and take advantage of any opportunity. And so that's what we wanted to do in our community. So 31 years later, Reverend Wells guest passed away this year, God bless him, uh, that he was able to serve in the 30 year term, 1 million and 600 individuals mm. in the city of Philadelphia. And also the organization was able to grow to London, India and Cambodia. So oh, really? that's, that's Reverend Wells, the guy. So that's what he started for us. That's our leader. And so, yeah. we're so you have some person. very serious yeah. shoes to fill. Some serious ones, some <laughs> yeah, serious that's ones. The truth. Yeah. yeah. You know what I, what I like when I went to your website, just to kind of get started with it, what I liked about it was that, you know, we're moving toward this kind of holistic kind of approach to dealing with the world. And uh, your agency has that kind of what I call neighborhood holism to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wish maybe you can comment a little bit about some of those kinds of services. because It's an example of an agency that really the city should be modeling in many of its other agencies. And not just, for example, not just a treatment program. Mm -hmm. But treatment involves jobs, and GED, and you know, all mm -hmm. the kinds of services that you run. I wonder how you evolved into that. Mm -hmm. You want to go first, bro? Then you can go. Uh, oh, you, you want me to go first? Okay. okay. I, I believe what the idea that Reverend Wells had was, you know, dealing with the homeless individual who come in who don't have ID, don't have no medical coverage, couldn't get no services. Uh, helping an individual, giving them some place to lay their head so they can get the services that they possibly would need would be um, sort of like coming in, helping them get ID, helping them get to the clinic to get service because a lot of men and females coming off the street don't get medically checked. You know, they go through long periods of times and not that, you know, getting um, their body checked out. So getting them in, giving them something to eat, getting them prepared to, you know, be able to go get the services that the city is offering, you know, but, you know, the first step is the ID problem after the, you know, the 9-11 thing, you know, you can't walk in no building that's true. In, in the city of Philadelphia now without ID. So that's what, you know, we began to 
focus on getting people off the street. If, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it takes. I used to be the clinical director down in the Kensington area, okay. the K and A mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. and I know it took about 60 days to get them on. And we used to go to BHSI, yeah. if you remember, yeah, yeah, get, yeah. Yeah. get services. So mm -hmm. I assume it's a little bit of a process. And in reality, you have to kind of almost uh, uh, pay their freight, so mm -hmm. to speak, yes. for mm -hmm. quite a while. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. In the sense we, we basically carry them, take to them, take care of them until they're actually able to get on their feet, you know, to be able to do some things for themselves, giving them transportation tokens and getting them to the different appointments that they might need to get to. We basically take care of all that. Yeah. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you were uh, originally you started out as a client or as a recipient Correct. of the service, you know, right. whatever language you like to mm -hmm. use. A client. <laughs> um, I would take a client. Oh, okay. I came to One Day at a Time um, in 1991 as a client. I was homeless. I actually lived in Cardboard Box City. Oh, okay. Um, can you explain Cardboard? I mean, I know <coughs> what it is okay. because of it, but I wonder, can you make Cardboard Box City was home. I can basically say it was home um, between Vaughn and race when you was able to walk from Vine Street all the way to City Hall, all the way on the upside, all the way down to Walnut mm -hmm. Street. Indeed. At the daytime was a lot of activities, but at night when you had nowhere to go, you, everybody had their own area in Cardboard Box City. It was like groups of home. individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was people from West Philly, South Philly, oh, North really? Philly. Oh, yes, definitely. I didn't know. We, we broke down into groups. It was North Philly yeah. area, South Philly area, West Philly area, you know, and those that was from Mount Area, what's up going, they was, <laughs> they, they couldn't really get involved. Yeah. So, so they we was even like had off neighborhoods the in the sub, under, uh, yes. yeah. It's it a culture. It was a culture. And, and, you know, one of the things that, and going back to the legacy of your father, Dr. Wells, and Dr. Wells, mm -hmm. Reverend yeah. Wells, I yeah. should yeah. say, mm -hmm. um, during that epidemic, uh, the drug infestation at mm -hmm. that time, 25, 30 years ago, increased the population of homelessness in mm -hmm. the city of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So uh, kudos, and I pay homage to your father because not only was he a man of, of, of spiritual concept and right. belief, right. but he had enough faith to communicate politically with yeah. the leaders in the city right. who said, wait a minute, here's a man that's really changing the delivery of services in the city. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's not a lot of folks in our city uh, at that time mm -hmm. who had that vision. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that name will ride forever. So I kudos to you, and, yeah. and man, I love your pop, I love your mom, mm -hmm. and I love mm -hmm. the work that you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. But when you look at, and even to this day, right, right. if you ride down the 25th Lehigh, but I yes. personally, I've changed the name of Lehigh Avenue to Recovery Boulevard. That's it. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah. you know, I, I'm saying that now mm -hmm. on the air live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The legacy of what your father has built yeah. and the multitude of many people. Yeah. And we're not just talking about homelessness, and it has it it has expanded for not only homelessness but drug and alcohol mm -hmm. treatment, HIV, mm -hmm. and all the other great mm -hmm. work that you guys are doing. GED, yeah, all kinds of services so, and facilities. Well, so, I tell you what, um, you know, the question that you asked at the beginning, you know, how do we get into all the other services? You know, when you come into one day at a time, we take it as you're being reborn. You know, yeah. you're stepping into a new life. A lot of guys after being out there on crack, cocaine, uh, dope, or some hard drugs that they're using over 20 years, some of these guys don't even know how to wash up anymore, yeah. you know, the proper way because they lived underneath the subway so long. So what Reverend Wells was able to do was take a holistic approach with helping a person, not by only helping that person, but also looked at the people who, he, who they affected that lived around them, such as their kids or yeah. whatever. So we also learned that these guys need job training. Yeah. They need GEDs. Uh, some of them needed some warrants lift. Some guys mostly come to us running from the police and so forth. Mm -hmm. And my father was that same type of guy. You know, when he ran to Philadelphia, he had to start all over again, running sure. from the police. So we took the same thing that my family and my mother and my father did and try to implement that into our communities. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it speaks of value, man. Um, I, I, you know, you look at the work, and, and I was listening to Daryl during that time uh, back in Cardboard City mm -hmm. and the many shelters at the time. Um, 1360 Ridge, 1209 Vine, Riverside. Reason why I know them, mm -hmm. I, I, I was a resident. I was the mm -hmm. king of the shelter. Right. Mm -hmm. And only to find out that all those folks, when the doors closed, even to this day, yeah. with the GA cuts, the mm -hmm. government cuts, you guys were taking a, just a host of folks on, yeah. providing life, breathing life back into people, mm -hmm. man. So, you yeah. know, it, it's. It, it, I'm glad yeah. we're doing this today. Mm -hmm. we, Thanks, we, we need to keep doing this. Yeah, we do. Thank yeah. you. Well, Rick. it's a real. Yeah. It, it, and, and I want to ask Daryl a couple mm -hmm. different kinds of questions, but it's a real, 
uh, <laughs> serious urban response to a serious urban problem. And there's not enough agencies that are doing that kind of work. Because mm -hmm. what happens is that, you know, and I don't mean to, to, to denigrate the hospitals and all, but mm -hmm. you know, they, they have, you know, go to your emergency room, you know, and they have mm -hmm. a certain limited way in which they deal with homelessness and poor people and, you know, people who need services. Uh, you actually <coughs> have taken it in, to a different level, I mm -hmm. think, in the sense of you're right there in the street with the people mm -hmm. in the neighborhood doing things. But there, I wanted to ask you, this is the question mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you. How did you hear about it and what was your life like that brought you to this place? Mm. Um, you mean living? I was living at Ridge Avenue Shelter. Um, I actually had a family member that was in one day at a time. I was the type of guy that stayed away from my family so I didn't have a lot of contact. It'd be six months before a family member would see me and he was searching for me. And he came to the shelter where I was staying at and left word that he was looking for me. Mm. So eventually when I got the message, I went to visit him at 1906 North 24th Street, which was one day at a time's first house. Oh, okay. And I talked with him and a couple of other guys that was living there talked to me. So it was like an outreach work. Yeah, outreach. I guess, yeah. Because, you know, it, it was outreach. Yeah. Back in 91, they, they actually was doing the outreach then. Yeah. So they talked to me and I went back to the shelter and every morning I would leave the shelter and come walk with the house and go to groups and go to meetings with them and do all the things and at the end of the day I would go back home, back to the shelter. Oh, okay. You know, uh, back then you would, like they would have you come, if you had somewhere to stay, they would have you come every day to see how dedicated you was about far as your recovery. So I would come there every day for five days, stay with them all day long, they would feed me, mm. you know, make sure I had something to eat because, you know, I was homeless, I didn't have any money, and I would go back to the shelter. And I walked from 24th and Burks to Broad and Ridge every day. Um, and then on the fifth day, they asked me did I want to become a member of One Day at a Time and what was I willing to do for my recovery. And they had a nice conversation with me and the very next morning I came in to the recovery house. Mm -hmm. and, and because of the name One Day at a Time, I mean, mm -hmm. all of us know mm -hmm. what that means, so mm -hmm. to speak. It's uh -huh. a, you know, an AA, NA recovery kind of almost uh, you know, it, it, salute. It, 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 yeah. 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 But, and what? I was wondering, I assume that the initial services, mm -hmm. there was a, just a lot of recovered people yeah. working. Yes, it was, it was all, you know, recovery. It was basically all residents back then that did the services. We didn't have any kind of mm -hmm. financial support from the city of Philadelphia. You know, Rum Wells did it all, what his thing was from the muscle. Um, you know, you had to be dedicated. We did a lot of um, community service work, you know, that got us noticed. And, and, and Rev, who would go beat City Hall door down mm -hmm. every day, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, with the different politicians and leaders of the city during that era, you know, with uh, Mr. Good, uh, uh, John Street, Rendell, and so on and so on, and I'm just going back to the different individuals that Rev would challenge yeah. for the support, yeah. to help, because what was unique that the city began to realize was he was doing things with no money mm -hmm. that the city couldn't do with money. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's probably and still going on today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I actually, <laughs> I actually yeah, it is definitely going on today. I stayed in the recovery house for 11 months. Oh, okay. You know, and I left the recovery house. Um, and went and did some other things, you know, got my education and things. And in 95, I came back to work for one day at a time. And I've been here ever since. Yeah. And, and you're playing FICA now, right? Huh? In your definitely, yeah. definitely. You know, it's funny, I, I, as a, again, I, I keep going back to the legacy of your father. Yeah. And being at your father's funeral at Deliverance Church, and I've been in there many times mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. church services mm -hmm. and other folks who have passed on. But again, being there that particular day and mm -hmm. looking at the enormous amount of folks yes. paying respect and homage to your father's leadership, man, right. was overwhelming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, dignitaries, politicians, yeah. other faith leaders were all there paying their due respect mm -hmm. to the legacy of your father. So, mm -hmm. and, and that, that day will never leave me. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Rick. Well, you, you know what uh, always amazed me about that the, the people who seem to have a significant impact are people who come. Uh, primarily out of a faith background, mm -hmm. they uh, it's they need the money, no question. Everyone needs the money to do mm -hmm. the work, but for some reason, uh, 
uh, it's a different drummer, mm -hmm. uh, it's a different uh, activity, it's a different kind of behavior, and it's almost, I've often said that, you know, you get points, you know, like mm -hmm. so that when you die and they opened up the pearly That's gates, it. they say, well, you got 25 points, you're, you're coming in. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. I would <laughs> I, agree I mean, with that. And yeah. you know, you know, kind of like you accumulate your points. I think that's what's happening here, too, in mm -hmm. the sense of, you know, mm -hmm. getting the word out. Mm -hmm. And so, y you wonder that the, the, the programs that aren't doing as well, uh, they, hmm. they, they tend to maybe have too much science in them, Well, if you know what I mean. I, I, you know, there's these wonderful programs out there, and they get well funded because they have wonderful writers, and, mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, and they have a good kind of sponsors, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and that programs that uh, uh, need uh, more of that kind of energy mm -hmm. given to them. Does now the city? I will say this much: that uh, Roland Lamb and the, the group in the city and Dr. Evans, yeah. Yeah. they seem to be overly, not overly, they seem to be much more sensitive yes. to the space that you're living in, and the need for that space to be more articulated in the mm -hmm. whole city of Philadelphia. Yeah. It's almost like you have, like I said, I keep going back, it's kind of almost a multi-purpose neighborhood center. Mm -hmm. And you almost think that, well, maybe, you know, if we had a health clinic, a full health clinic inside there with you, you know, like, and, and, and almost a holistic, and we've had a couple of shows where we did it about whole it, mm -hmm. you know, holistic, mm -hmm. holistic approaches. Okay. So, you know, you wonder if that might not turn the tide because, you know, we have such uh, I guess, uh, horrible uh, uh, rates of success in the sense of over mm -hmm. periods of years, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what Well, you're my thing is, uh, number one, you know, we do this for God, you know? Mm -hmm. So we don't do it for the money, but we definitely take the blessings from God that come along with this. And I believe one of our blessings is have been, you know, the, the road that Reverend Wells was able to pay for us is that now we have relationships with Dr. Evans, uh, Roland Lamb, Dr. And Catherine Williams in the city to where they're saying, listen, you, you're a very intricate part of the city, but we want to place some more things around you without you losing your movement. Right. So that's where we at now. Uh, and it's really good because now we're just starting to work on a real wellness center because we call our synony, a, 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 our community, a wellness community. But we get starting to st uh, work on our community one-stop shop, you know, where you can go and our partners stop. Uh, they're up located on the second floor of our building where you can go to them for treatment. You could come to us for HIV and AIDS testing, for DNA groups, for food banks, for GEDs, and so yeah. on. But also we're working on a living facility um, and underneath that facility so people can come and do kind of a one-stop shop. So when you go back into society, you have everything that you need now from the health aspect to the education aspect of it. Yeah, because a lot of times when, when I used to work clinics, so mm -hmm. to speak, is you send them someplace and they never get there. You know, or they wind up going right, that's true. someplace else. Yeah. So this whole multi-purpose in, in one space is good. Now, as a person who initially was a recipient of the service, because some of the okay. things we need to, is, would that make a lot of sense to you as an individual who was coming in for service, that if you could have gone and had a place where you got, you know, everything that you needed, including mm -hmm. what were considered to be public health kind of concerns, you know, like a physical exam and a, you yeah. know, and, I would and agree antibiotics that antibiotics if you needed mm -hmm. them for yeah. a cold and things like that. Yeah. I think that would actually help the individual, you know what I mean, to have everything that they would possibly need right there. You know, because well, one thing that I believe is frustration plays a intricate part in recovery when individuals, because we call them individuals now, instead of clients or residents, we call them individuals. When they become frustrated, you know, a lot of times their character defect comes out where they get so frustrated they quit mm -hmm. you know what I mean we try to keep them motivated we also have partnered with the clinic which is right across the street at from the main uh, building at 2432 Wesley Avenue we have a clinic across the street that we just partnership with Mel just mentioned that we partnership with uh, sobriety through outpatient you know, so we're building partnerships so we can basically which is have a licensed outpatient right there. program. Right? Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah, you got to have. You know, yeah, I mean, which yeah. we all are, you know, trying to format. So when you make it more comfortable for the individual to get all the services they need, they are more inclined to want to stay and see the view that you're trying to paint for them, as they can see it. Because we paint pictures for individuals saying. Like for me, I'm in recovery and I can tell you everything about recovery, but a lot of times it takes for the individual to see some of that, you know, because they have been disappointed so long and, and so many periods of times, you know, going in and out of places. So we try to have everything right there at the one-stop shop so they have no excuses. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> no reason to run. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? And the most important thing that I learned that I didn't say 
when I first started coming around, the most important thing was for me, someone offered me a sandwich. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, food, clothes, yeah. and shelter, mm-hmm. you know. The you basics. know what I mean? The basics. Yeah, the basics. Someone offered me a, 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 a half of their sandwich. You know what I mean? They said, did you eat? I was like, no. I said, well, here, you can have half of this sandwich. You know what I mean? And that was more motivation to me than any any other thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the things that I, uh, I, it reminds me a lot of what you say mm-hmm. it reflected some of the work I did in, in Kensington. And it was we, we opened up this kind of drop cleaning center mm-hmm. it was. It was a kind of an mm-hmm. interesting thought when you think mm-hmm. about it. And we had these three or four showers and we had to have a, a person there because, you know, showers can get kind of mm-hmm. a little odd at times. And we had food there so people would come in, get a, get a, a shower, a bath, and, you know, have mm-hmm. shampoo and things like that, get something to eat. We never told them they had to come into the program, but there was always a, uh, a, a recovery kind of counselor there mm-hmm. from 12 to 8 at night because that's Correct. when we got most of our business was at midnight mm-hmm. to 8 in the morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we got so many referrals out of that unit into the outpatient program mm-hmm. that it was almost like an admission unit. Mm-hmm. And how did we do it? Which is a similar way that it sounds like some of the things that you're doing. We did it by just f- catering to very, very basic life processes, mm-hmm. food, yeah. some clothing, things. shelter, mm-hmm. and support. Because, you know, you can't, you can't really build your self-esteem if you don't have food, clothing, mm-hmm. and shelter. You can't feel that you have any control over your life without some of those issues. Mm-hmm. And that is a kind of a beginning way. And I often say that there's a kind of sterileness when people come into a regular clinic, you know, and they're sitting yeah, there and there's a receptionist setting. and yeah. they're waiting to talk to someone. And mm-hmm. It reminds them of almost of other places that are negative experiences yeah. for them coming into a facility. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like to get them entered into the place, we almost need to think differently about life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I wonder what, uh, if you had to uh, reflect on your life, mm-hmm. um, w- would you agree or disagree that you said the sandwich, the half of a sandwich, which is kind of interesting, mm-hmm. you didn't get the whole sandwich, but someone mm-hmm. shared a sandwich with Correct. you, which said, says a lot about the facility. So I, I, I wonder if, if we had a bread kind of a food program Will we get a lot more referrals? I mean, it sounds simplistic mm-hmm. to say it that way. Yeah. Well, you want I, I think you would get more opportunities yeah, for a referral. You know, everybody who would come might just come for the meal. But if you imagine, I remember going to Papa John's yeah, okay. every day. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? For the pie. Yes. You know what I mean? And you would get more opportunities to talk to individuals about the things that they're going to and be lucky enough just that one day that person might be ready. Right. Do you know what I mean? To save their soul. You know what I mean? Because that's what we always look at when we try to meet individuals at their level, not at our level, because sometimes our level might be a little confusing for like Mr. Rick and me and Mel and you. Our levels are different. Yeah. But when you go down to their level with an offering of a bag of chips and a sandwich, it makes all the difference. That statement, that that kind of vision would make more conversation with an individual than anything else. I totally agree. You know I mean? yeah, mm-hmm. And very, very therapeutic. Mm-hmm. Different from traditional treatment settings and clinical settings where you can, co- like for instance, you guys probably have a, a, a drop. Mm-hmm. A person can just come in mm-hmm. without having a referral or, you know, uh, and see a host of people and say, you know, I'm tired without that behind the desk kind of, Delivery mm-hmm. and, and you, f- you know, food is the yes, sure. Really, food without would change without, the whole I mean, mindset. I mean, mm-hmm. It sounds like I'm almost anti some things, but I'm not. It, without necessarily filling out ten forms to get to the place, mm-hmm. see, and eventually the forms will get filled out. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it's a matter of a process of how mm-hmm. one fills them out, mm-hmm. and the, the start is, uh, I think, particularly critical. Right. With, with the homeless population, one thing that, um, it's, which is this, my opinion. One thing that comes with homeless is two things. It's either drug and alcohol or mental health. Mm-hmm. And being on that side, looking on this side, your first vision or the first picture that you get of an individual makes all the difference whether you're going to have a great conversation mm-hmm. or no conversation. That's right. mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, when you go into traditional places, they give you a, a number, you have a seat, and you sit there. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, we do have a 24-hour drop, you know, where people could come in. Mm-hmm. just to sit and talk, look at TV. Mm-hmm. If they're hungry, we give them something to eat. And then, you know, we ask them, well, what are you planning on doing? Mm-hmm. You know, where are you 
stay in that? Are you have somewhere to stay? Are you homeless? You know what I mean? Um, you know, do you do drugs? Uh, you know, how can we help you? You know what I mean? Because we make them feel important. And, and that was the key to be able to have an individual feel important because living on the street, you lose, uh, I would say, you know, you lose. You kind of lose uh, your dignity. I could, dignity, yeah. you, your self-esteem yeah. is real low. You know, you feel worthless, you know, and things of that nature. And just to help to see someone's spirit be lifted, you know what I mean? And, and you can see them there emotionally, mm -hmm. see their spirit lifted, you know. Uh, like to say, you know, men don't cry. Mm. Yes, we do. Yeah. You know what I mean? And to tell a man it's okay to cry about what you're going through, but look at this. We have a way to help you, mm -hmm. possibly help you with your problem if you just talk to us. And they begin to talk to us. They might not stay that day, but they're guaranteed to come back the next day. Hey, how you doing? You know, I did okay. You know what I mean? And, you know, it's just building a relationship with individuals. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To just be a sort of like a light. We we try to be like a light on Lehigh Avenue. We've been on Lehigh Avenue for a long period of time. Everybody know about one day at a time. You know, they know a little bit of history of Reverend mm -hmm. Wells and, and what our organization does. And all we do is be uh, attraction instead of promotion. We do outreach. We go yeah, all up yeah, in Kensington. Yeah. You know, we go all over the city talking to individuals at their level, where they at. You know what I mean? Trying to let them understand and realize that there's a better way to live. You don't have to live like this no more. Yeah. And I'm a prime example because I run the shelter that we have, which holds 38 homeless men. And I tell them my story. I have a community with them. I give them power, the freedom of speech to express how they feel and the things that they're uh, want and are willing to do and try to support them. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I was thinking, Mel, you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that other countries. Um, right. Um, right. Well, one of, you know, kind of what we was kind of saying guest stand was, you know, how do we reach our clients? A lot of what we use, we don't just use a peer staff. We use peer support. Yeah. So peer support goes on to the streets. Reverend Wells was just a guru of outreach. You know, yeah. he'd go to the family door, knock on their door and say, hey, do your son need help today? Or he'd go sleep with the homeless people down in Cardboard City. And one thing that was intricate to Reverend Wells, he was able to start doing outreach in other cities. So what happened was we, he went to London on a trip maybe about 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. And when he went to London on a trip, he stayed on the street. Oh. And we have partners who have a church also in London. So they liked what Reverend Wells was doing. And so they started one day at a time in the UK. Today yeah. we have 12 houses in London. Oh. And then yeah. uh, after he kept doing this outreach, he went to India and also done the outreach. And then it gets continued to grow. So still to the day, our most important component of one day at a time is doing outreach. Mm -hmm. Going to the people, going to the problem, yeah. not judging. I'm not saying that, you know, you have this issue. I need you to come to my office tomorrow, 9 o'clock, and you need a token. You don't have those excuses with us because we'll come straight and sit on the street with you. So that was one of the parts of how Reverend Wells was the guru of outreach because yeah. he just didn't do outreach in the city of Philadelphia. He did outreach abroad. You know, he was like the, the Mandela, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. You know, when you think yeah. about the international, to be an outreach worker, mm -hmm. and I, I always um, kind of look at this like this, most people chase a paycheck, but if you chase your passion, a paycheck can chase wow. you. That's mm -hmm. it. That's it. Very and true. That's great, 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 great. Yeah. yeah. And I'm telling you, man, it speaks in volume. It does. The work. Mm -hmm. We know other folks in the city are doing certain things, but the legacy which your father right, right. built. Right. And, and early, it wasn't on funding. Mm -hmm. It was on passion right. and purpose. Right. Well, my father, just to put out there, you know, me just growing up in his household, was he was just the the guy on the street that was on crack at the beginning. Yeah. You know, my mom was also a barmaid, so we were just the average family in North Philadelphia that just decided to try to make some type of change mm -hmm. one day at a time. And so through that, what was able to happen through my father even going into detox down to Jeffrey Center. When he went into Jeffrey Center, <laughs> he came Saint out. And you know, and, you know yeah. and all of us, when we get through a, a blackout stage or a <laughs> stage when we have to stay still, we get all these thoughts. Yeah. So my mom was the strong woman who said, you know, just don't, Think about the thoughts, do the thoughts as yeah. well, the good thoughts. Mm -hmm. So when she came home, she gave him one bedroom uh, to have another friend to recover with him. Name was Wilhelm at the yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, from Wilhelm. And so he went from one house to another house until we got we grew up to about 32 houses in the city of Philadelphia. And what's great about that whole thing is your mother and father stayed right in the hood. Still there. Still yeah. there. Still there. That mm -hmm. means a lot, folks. You know, if you and, and that, I mean, that's, you know, as we say, take the cheese off and make it plain. Mm -hmm. They didn't move out. They mm -hmm. stayed in the belly of the beast 
where they can reach the multitude of people yes. that they were really trying to help. What's interesting about that whole evolution uh, is that it did stay in the neighborhood and it didn't get, quote, corrupted mm -hmm. by income, so Correct. to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and sometimes what happens is that movements lose their Identity. lust for life yeah. Yeah. because they now are making X dollars mm -hmm. and they have a new facility. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. And, you know, however you package that thought and mm -hmm. kept it there, uh, is something I think that the, the city could yeah. learn a lot mm -hmm. from in the sense of keeping people in the neighborhood in which they grew up and worked. And, you mm -hmm. know, our neighborhoods changed so much yeah. and have been actually... Yeah. Yeah. And you guys got some great people on the board mm -hmm. yeah. to help you. We'll you like Sharif Street, yeah. there Martin Conley, yeah. Millie. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Just, you know, people who understand in this city the significance of wanting to support good programs. Yeah. 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 And don't yeah. forget about Sylvester Johnson. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, Johnson. former commissioner right. Sylvester yeah. Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, I would say we call it the family. You yeah. know, rather it's our board, rather it's our clients. It's the, the, our family is the city of Philadelphia. Yeah. You know, when we co when we're called on from the city, we don't hesitate. We don't ask about when the check is coming. We go do the work. Some things we never get a check for. Some things we don't get money for. But that yeah. always reminds us that we're on a mission yeah. and that we're a movement. So, you know, yeah. I want to ask you. That's the 39th police district, right? That was the well, district I grew split. up in. It's split between oh, the 22nd, 22nd and 39th. Oh, okay. yeah, I have no separation. And I'm too. wondering, you know, because historically, uh, the, the DNA field doesn't really work r well with police departments generally. Mm -hmm. My impression is that you do work mm -hmm. well with them. Real I mean, closely. Re yeah, very closely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the sense of do they bring people to you or how do they, what kind of work do you do? Right. I mean in the sense of referrals. Almost. Well, i tell you um, one thing that Dad and Commissioner Sylvester Johnson were, were great at was saying that everybody don't need to be incarcerated. Most people mm -hmm. need to be rehabilitated. So uh, that's where our relationship started off at with the police department, to where the police department would bring us people. Then when guys would come off the street, we ask for their trust and say, hey, you know you need to go into the police officers to get your warrant lifted. And then the, the police officers were able to work, even the district attorney's office, God bless her, Lynn Abraham at yeah, the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's still going on with district attorney Seth Williams. Mm -hmm. So we have a real intricate uh, relationship where we're able to work with one another to help clean up the streets but also help them reach some of their numbers that they're trying to get yeah. you know people walk off the street and come into one day at a time or people we meet on the street are not just the average Joe okay. yeah. you know we yeah. deal with the roughest roughest toughest guys in the city you have a lot of different recovery groups but one yeah. thing one day at a time we deal with the rapists we deal with the murderers we deal with the guys who just came home for 20 years you said something about emergency emergency room we're like the second emergency <laughs> room here yeah. in the city the you know, primary one the primary <laughs> when they put you out of the emergency room or the hospital you know where you do come to uh, that's the one day at a time drop. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know what, and speaking of that, even um, when we're talking about the collaboration with the City of Philadelphia Police Department, mm -hmm. and, and I want folks to get this, mm -hmm. when you do that annual Thanksgiving dinner, yes. the Police Department is there acting yes. servants, serving the dinners and food. And it's really to kill the stigma how folks look at law enforcement. You gotta look at that on a deeper level. These guys are in there serving food, the same police mm -hmm. officers that work in the district, mm -hmm. and it shows about the collaboration. <coughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I will say that, you know, the police department, uh, anybody in the professional field, you have your own problems in your family as well. Yeah. So we really take that family mm -hmm. approach. We have police officers who drop their kids off, you know, their grown kids off at one day at a time, for them to stay at one day at a time. One thing that was good about that, he can go into the courthouse at that time yeah. and work with some of the judges' kids who yeah, were, you know, because sure. we all went astray at one time, we all had problems at one yeah. time. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the collaborations that we do on Thanksgiving Day with one day at a time in the police department, like you say, Rick, to kill the stigma. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a criminal history when you join the, into the, I'm yes, trying I to did. get a little bit more of that feel. Yes, I, did. I actually was, I had like, three years clean and had forgot about a warrant. Oh. And I was driving, coming from getting something to eat, driving my car, got pulled over. Up came the warrant what? that I forgot all about. It was a Berkeley warrant, you know. Told my story, they, Reverend Wells went to court with me. Judge looked at Reverend Wells, looked at me, looked at everything I had accomplished, and threw it out. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Yeah. Well, it, Interesting that you say that because mm -hmm. when the agency hooks up with the recipient of the service and mm -hmm. goes to court, mm -hmm. it does have impact yes. in the sense of mm -hmm. disposing of. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, it takes a lot of time for 
one day at a time yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. to do that kind of work because you're yeah. sitting there and waiting and waiting and you're going to court yes. and all that. Mm -hmm. But that's a service that is tremendously valued mm -hmm. that isn't util utilized right. enough, I think, mm -hmm. in treatment. And that's what Mel was saying. Like, we ask the individuals when they come in, do they have that problem? Let us know now. And we get to work on it right away. Mm -hmm. We've been in New York with clients that had warrants in New York. Uh, we've had people from Baltimore. We've had the mm -hmm. certain uh, officials in Baltimore yeah. call us to ask us, could they bring a client to our program to get cleaned up because they was a witness in something yeah. that happened in Baltimore. We get them from Virginia, uh, North of Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, Baltimore, uh, uh, New York, you know, by people looking at our website and I guess from uh, our history of who we are and what we do, we get a lot of calls to, from, you know, the different law enforcement in the city and feel like, and also what happened was there was a, uh, before uh, Sylvester Johnson and the detective mm -hmm. where they would set up sting operations. Commis Commissioner Timothy at the time. Yeah. 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 They would set up sting operations and Reverend Wells, me, and a few other individuals once they brought the individual to the location where the sting operation was set up, if they didn't have a serious criminal record or a real bad warrant, mm -hmm. they would give them opportunity to either go to Roundhouse or go with one day at a time. Mm. You know what I mean? Some went with they would, one day at a time. It's shocking to me. Some of them would go to the, want to go to the Roundhouse. Yeah, but yeah. They, <laughs> here's, the other, here's the part. A lot of them would go <laughs> to the Roundhouse. I know. Because one thing, when you went to the Roundhouse, if you didn't have a staircase, you could sign yourself out in yeah. 24 hours. And they thought they were, you know, they thought yeah. they were getting arrested, but they yeah. was really getting rescued, rescued. by coming to one yeah. day at a time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, I often tell this story. <laughs> uh, my doctor, the, 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 the area that I worked in was drunk driving. Yeah. And I used to have to, it was the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Grant mm -hmm. that I was one. And I had to ride with the cops at night. You know, mm -hmm. my father was a former, you know, police okay. officer. And I used to ride the mid, they call last down, you know, mm -hmm. the, that ship. Yeah. And when they used to arrest drunk drivers, we had an option under the diversion court, you know, mm -hmm. uh, ARD at the time was called right. Accelerated Rehabilitative Disposition, yeah. that they could do 30 days in jail or 28 days in a rehab program. Do you know that most of them took jail? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. no one, the way it was expressed to me mm -hmm. was that no one bothered them for 30 mm -hmm. days mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. opposed to them being kind of in a yeah. almost in treatment and yeah. forced to kind of do things yeah. and to face their their life. Mm -hmm. So after a while, we started to get the judge to not give the option. Okay. Because there were too many, there was like 60 people, 60, yeah. 70 people that out of 100 who would take the option to do, th so I can do 30 standing on my, you know, yeah. upside down because mm -hmm. it was local, they went to local, you know, yeah. jail. Instead of talking to someone about what's personally going yeah. on with me. So eventually we converted it to where they had to go. Mm -hmm. And then they would then be filtered into the the system, you know, mm -hmm. maybe go to one day at mm -hmm. a time, mm -hmm. and, and uh, other programs. It's an interesting kind of stigma that that, that follows people through their uh, incarceration and, and getting out. It's almost like a badge of honor. They want to, you know, I've, yeah. I've had the, the, the clients uh, when I was working at Kensington that would say, "Oh, my parole's almost up, and I think I." I, I, I'm going to go back anyway, so I want to violate my parole because to be in prison as a parole violator mm -hmm. is better than going back without violating parole. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you like know, the, the mentality. Yeah, the street code yeah. of a badge. Mm -hmm. It's like Boy Scouts, you know, you get an Eagle badge. Right. On, on the street code of ethics, that's a badge to them. Yes. You know what I mean? It's and good. it's this society. And then a lot of guys have become institutionalized it, yeah. right, based on all the contributing factors, education, poverty, and prior experiences. So, I mean, it, one thing I like about what you guys are doing is you, they can come in as they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned earlier, you don't have to do uh, an assessment evaluation, 10 sheets of paper. And these days are critical. Folks need help. Mm -hmm. Folks need healing and folks need help. Right. Based on all, you know, the cut in the GA cuts, the you know, with public assistance and all that. It's right. it's not getting any better out there. Mm -mm. So we need more programs like one day at a time, Thanks. working at that level. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. You know, right. So Thanks for it. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, an interesting uh, experience at least. Mm -hmm. When you used to go out to Cardboard City, you know that the, you know the the, mm -hmm. the place. Uh, what was it like? I mean, I mean, a lot of people in, the, in that are watching the show don't know that whole experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember walking by it, and I remember 
uh, well, being concerned about a lot of drug use and, 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 and late at night, but mm -hmm. what was it like, I mean, mm. there? I mean, for just... It was, well, me being from Cardboard Box City, it was normal to me. You know, I felt like right at home. Right. You know what I mean? But my job, when I went in with Rev, we was going in to try to save souls and bring mm -hmm. people out. Because nothing down there but was, you didn't have any security down there. There was a lot of things going on that the city and the police didn't know about. Mm -hmm. It was a hard job. It was like a concentration camp, I guess. Yeah. Because you had those who intimidated, influenced, mm -hmm. took control, you know, was the mayor of Cardboard Box City. Oh, okay. yeah. You know, individuals yeah. thought they was the mayor of Cardboard Box City. They had the enforcers. Yeah. There was a lot of intimidation. Uh, you know, a lot of robberies, a lot, a lot of things went on down there that the city didn't know about. And I believe that's when they realized it became a problem because the people that, you know, quote unquote, day to day was trying to get through there and things began to happen to them. And that's when they started closing it down because yeah. it became a threat to the city. To mm -hmm. the general population. Yeah, general so population. Mm -hmm. That's when something was done about it, when it became yeah. a threat to the city. Yeah. Yeah. But for years, it ran with, you know, people, you had uh, different organizations came out to feed the homeless and, you know, they well knew about this for many years being there, but wasn't a lot of funding put towards, you know, trying to straighten out that situation. Y yeah, you know, yeah. until Rev Well started going mm -hmm. down there filming and, you know, making it well known that this is what's going on right underneath the city hall in the city of Philadelphia, yeah, you know, and you know the city of Philadelphia doesn't like bad promotion. Yeah, you, you know what's funny yeah. about when you try to talk about Cardboard City? Mm -hmm. um, I had a client recently who, you know, we say Cardboard City. You think of the cardboard, what were they using? Um, refrigerator comes in a cardboard box. Right. Mm -hmm. Televisions back mm -hmm. then came in a cardboard, cardboard box. box. The client said to me, there's no way I can go back to be homeless because now, since they made flat screen TVs, the boxes aren't that big. That they're a smaller home now. Right. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, yeah. 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 So yeah you, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, and, and believe me, being a part of that, that time, you know, I think we got clean around. I got yeah, clean in 1990. Yeah. <laughs> Love Park, Cardboard City, and even going out today with the city of Philadelphia and doing the campaign and mm -hmm. seeing where homeless people are, it's, it's amazing. They're sleeping now under bridges and and uh, there's a guy down off the Schuylkill River who built his tent. He, and and uh, it's, it, homelessness will probably never cease in the city of Philadelphia based on all the other contributing factors. Correct. Poverty, uh, mm -hmm. education, no jobs, unemployed, over, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the high it's incidence, painful. Yeah, the high incidence yeah. of just yeah. behavioral health yeah. challenges with the yeah. population. You know, a lot of that cardboard issue or the development of homelessness came because when they emptied out the state hospitals, if you know, in the late yes. 70s, mm -hmm. they just dumped them into the city. There were no real boarding homes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they claimed there were, but there were very few. So what did they do? They just lived on the street and found a little corner somewhere and eventually found each other, right. you know, yeah. in a sense. And, and you, you know, part of that is, is just the fact that the, the state, the Commonwealth, started uh, wanting to save money by closing down the state hospitals. But and then the overall <coughs> enormous amount of people, and I, and I knew you could test that, was because of our addiction. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't become homeless because of uh, mental health or lack of a job. I was using drugs to a point where I could no longer pay rent, and, mm -hmm. and it's really strange. How did I wind up downtown at Father John's mm -hmm. and that whole level of denial and refusal to find out who am I one of these people and then you look around and you're sleeping at 1340 Cherry Street mm -hmm. on the floor waiting to get a POS yes. and that time was critical and to survive that era and to come out on the other side and there are a lot of people working in the field today thank God that we were able to get through being homeless, sleeping in love parks, a bit suburban station. It's, it's amazing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's nothing but God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you read that, uh, that book by Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow, yeah. uh, it, you, know, you get the distinct impression that when they closed the state hospitals down, that the new um, Jim Crow is putting them in prison and that they're utilizing the prison system, at least according to Michelle Alexander. Yeah. I kind of agree with everything she says, actually. 
that, that what we're doing is now we're housing people with large amounts of mental health and drug and mm -hmm. alcohol issues, maybe 60 or 65 percent of the population, that really need to some other alternative mm -hmm. plan like one day at a time and others. But you have this big industrial complex now mm -hmm. around privatizing of prisons, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So you, you could see where the system kind of even shifted to the point where the dollars are not with the programs that really could provide the service. They're actually still pretty much with powerful mm -hmm. industrial mm -hmm. yeah. kind yes. of uh, yeah. Yeah. issues. Yeah. I don't know if that makes well, sense. No, I it think yeah. uh, good sense. we're working with now, we have some meetings set up with Secretary Wetzel, mm -hmm. uh, with also the District Attorney's Office to figure out how can we get in there to get some of those correction dollars that they build in these prisons with, that they locking people away with, that have minor issues, you know. You have some people who's getting roof, as they say on the street. You know, mean roof means you're getting time. You know, if you get locked up with two bags of small crack, right. you might get end up with a few yeah. years. So we're definitely trying to uh, a test and you know reach out to these individuals who can really help us to get the right dollars in the community so we can use it for the right thing. So we're working on that. Yeah, and, and when I say 60 or 65, I'm talking about really minor offenses. I'm not minor, talking yeah, about yeah, people yeah, minor. who are you know uh, killing people and yeah. you know those kinds of mm -hmm. issues, but people who basically it was their third arrest for drug possession. Correct. Or oh yeah, they were prostituting themselves because mm -hmm. they had a heroin habit yeah, or whatever it would be, and it, it just seems like it's the wrong place to be putting them. But definitely right. But we're sitting here as people in human services, and we think there's a lot of things that should change, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you don't, you don't and really. And that's get. one of the reasons why we always say, vote. Yeah. We need to vote. You know what I mean? It's like all our individuals, we get them registered for the registration card, and we don't force them, but we kind of convince them that it's good to vote because your vote is so important that will help make the decision because everything is geared for the youth now. You know what I mean? You, you have the youth walking around with GPS systems on their ankle. I'm talking about 14, 15 year olds who are killing people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's just sad. Yeah, um, if we could speak on that topic, yeah. just really, you know, you know, it's a shame that gets really going on, you know, institution-wise with the prisons and so forth, especially with the young individuals. We do prison tours at CJC at the courthouse, yes. and I see young guys 13, 14, get 20, 30 years, yeah, man. you know, and it's a shame because <laughs> there's nobody also in the system who can speak about where these guys come from. Mm -hmm. You know, how would you be if you grew up with at the age of five years old with your mom running tricks in the house with no food in the refrigerator at all, never been to school? I think you're kind of dealing with even the, the young men now mm -hmm. or the crack babies, they wanted to help yeah. back in 1980s yeah, and the yeah, early right. 90s. Mm -hmm. And now that they're grown men, they don't even mention about, you know, how were they born and did they come through a crack mom or mm -hmm. however that was done. So it's a real devastating thing going on. And as Rick touched on, there's so much poverty yeah. that's going on in our community with men and women trying to feed their kids. People do not even understand what's really going on at nighttime in high-risk places, yeah. meaning, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, crack houses, uh, North Philadelphia, uh, deep in West Philadelphia, the bottom, uh, Kensington Avenue, Kensington and Allegheny. People are out there because they're trying to survive. And now when the police officer running into them, they're not trying to hear about, well, what done happened to you for the last 15 years yes. that got you to this point right. this one day? Well, and also, yeah. I, I guess I could say it because uh, I, I'm, I'm the white face among four, maybe, here. Uh, we didn't notice, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> we just thought you were white. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that, that if you look at the same offense mm -hmm. for a person of color and a person who historically is considered white, although there is really mm -hmm. no white people, but mm -hmm. okay, let's just say that for the sake of the discussion. Mm -hmm. What Michelle Alexander shows statistically is that the same offense, the person of color will get prison time. According yeah, to her definitely. data, yeah. and the, the the white guy would be given probation. Mm -hmm. So when you think of that, mm -hmm. that's what she called her book, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Jim Crow, mm -hmm. yes, the new yeah. slavery, and a lot of too. facts that she wrote in the book are very factual. And when we look, and it's we wrote when we look at it, even now in the city of Philadelphia, just imagine if they legalized marijuana, would that reduce a lot of the criminal acts, uh, folks getting locked up? Mm. Mm -hmm. Would they I refer them to jail or treatment? Mm -hmm. I think right now that, you know, with the system that is changing, 
I think they will refer a lot of people into treatment at this moment with yeah. the stigma that's in sure, the air yeah. and with the government's talking about, uh, even here in the city of Philadelphia, because you know, do you have enough room for the murders or do you keep locking up people with minor offenses? So exactly. it's always yeah. politics yeah. And, in the play. And, and, and think about it, twenty nine, thirty thousand dollars a year to incarcerate yeah. someone? Yeah. And we can put them in uh, rehab for ten grand or right. eight grand? Or yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. three for the price of one, yeah. Yeah. so right. to speak. And the effect is not much different in mm -hmm. the sense of, you know, yeah. we're, we're not getting $29,000 worth <laughs> of rehab. Right. Now, they don't right. claim to be a rehab facility. I understand that. Right. But still, they leave prison, and the recidivism rates are so high yeah. that you start to wonder, what, where's the mindset here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? and, and after a person being incarcerated for long periods of time, what are they coming out to? Right. Yeah. Well, that's what are the they doing while they're in there to prepare them yeah. to come out? Well, because after a person does, say a person gets seven and a half to 15, yeah. seven and a half years of being incarcerated, coming out, the world looks different. You know, yeah. if you're locked up for uh, six and a half to 12 months, when you come out, everything is different now. What you remember when you was out here is no longer here. So now a person is coming out, mm -hmm. Um, from out of incarceration into a world that looks totally different. How, what are we doing to prepare them and help them reiterate themselves back into society? Well, that's where I think the advantage of your facility right. is because you have that functional kind of reality based uh, uh, issue that mm -hmm. you deal with and you couch the treatment and mm -hmm. the kinds of programs that you have mm -hmm. like in reality, right. as opposed to having them just have talk therapy or mm -hmm. some other thing. So I think uh, it would be nice if we could see more of those programs and see more affiliations with your kinds mm -hmm. of programs mm -hmm. with people who are coming out of right. a variety of settings, yeah. prisons, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of different well, places. I will say, you know, I was speaking to Mr. Lamb about this as well, that one day at a time, you know, we're just not a company, we're not just a movement, but we're the family. Mm -hmm. And we were speaking about probation, and I have been incarcerated myself, and when people are talking about, well, you're going to get out on parole, a lot of guys don't want to take that parole because they have nothing to go out to. Mm -hmm. They have no system, they have no family to even go out to, especially with African Americans uh, in the community. If you're living in public housing and so forth and so on, that you can't even go back to the home that you came from. That's right. So when you, when you compare, you know, and I really don't like playing the black and white thing because I believe that we all have issues. Well, it's there. But, but it's there. It's, it's, <laughs> it's there. there. It's, it's, it's definitely there. But I will say in the African-American community, you know, you have crack also in the household. You have uh, drugs that's in the household. You have gambling that's in the household. So they're, they're being released to high-risk situations. And so that's why when they are released to one day at a time, we let them know that we're your true family. We're yeah. your family now. Because a lot of the things that their family were doing when they got incarcerated were not the good things and the things that can make them go back into the system. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. And just thinking about point. you said 29 or 30 yeah. for one individual, yeah. I believe the yeah, president yeah, would back me up. That's it. If we could get 29 or yeah, 30. Yeah, think of that. We, we could do 10 to 1. That's right. We'd get them the house and everything. Yeah. 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 <laughs> get the mortgage. Get everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I believe we would have a little bit better results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? 29 30 is a lot. Well, uh, to be somewhat, I guess, I, I don't want to be too no. negative about mm -hmm. the Department of Corrections right. because I'll hear too many negative we, yeah. <laughs> no, feedback. No, no, no. I got but it. the reality of life is, is that that you know we would like to see more of those dollars definitely for rehab yes. mm -hmm. and you know and community exposure kind of programs mm -hmm. and it does seem that it's a tremendous amount of money uh, to put someone somewhere and when they come out the recidivism rates continue to be relatively high mm -hmm. that it just doesn't make sense but if you have the ear of XYZ person mm -hmm. who's a politician and they can mm -hmm. continue to fund you know, the privatization, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. of uh, correctional facilities. Yeah. It, it's a, a road that's very, very difficult to overcome. I think um, we have to take also the problem to them, take the problem to the correctional facility, facilities, and take the problem to Harrisburg, you know. We do a lot of talking. I could have the air of somebody, but like one thing that Reverend Wells was great at is having a movement. You know, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're make camp. We'll do a camping trip to Harrisburg just to sleep on the steps with yeah. 500 people to get the attention <coughs> of the state rep or the person that's coming out or the secretary that's getting out of their car in the morning just to show them that. And it might take five times. It might take ten times. But I think in our communities here in the city of Philadelphia, we have to start going back to being a movement again of people to make the demands reach True. us.
Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I think we, we have to stop thinking so myopic in the, in the sense that, that we're working here and we're working only in North Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That's it. And that we realize that what happens here is significant to those things that are going on here. And that influence and that policy change yes. is critical mm -hmm. to the kinds of things that we want to do. Wow. I agree. So, so now, let me ask um, in terms for the, the viewers. You, ha you guys have a drop. Is there a website or phone yeah, number yeah, yeah. for folks to reach one day at a time? Yeah, the website, you know, you can go to the internet, www.odat.us, www.odat.us. Uh, our 24-hour hotline, which we can use this number for now, 215-226-7860, 215-226-7860. Uh, a phone that would definitely be op uh, answered 24 hours a day would be the AFCOM Center, 215-227. 0485-215-227-0485. And that's a real live person that's going to answer? That's a real drugs. live peer support yes. person, too. Yeah, that know what you're oh, talking okay, about. Oh, okay, a certified right. peer that's specialist that's type. Right. That's yeah. great. So, so often yeah. we call and they say, do you want channel one or two <laughs> that, or three? That, 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 that's not us. And a half Which hour later, you might get the operator. We're not to that level But yet. you're not no. there. No. You're, no. You're, you're and we don't want to be there. And folks want to talk to somebody. Yeah, that's talk. Folks want to talk to somebody. Yeah, that's true. Mainly at the moment of, I want to, you know, when you get to that moment where you say, Right now, I'm tired. I want help. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very disturbing when you call and there's that voicemail because all it takes is one second of uh, uh, have that hope that now I'm ready, but now mm -hmm. I got to talk to. Yeah. Listen like that to window me. barely opens so often, and when you can get it to crack open, yeah. you better get up in there now. That's mm -hmm. right. Because you want to get that opportunity widened. again yeah. to help that person. Yeah. Well, let me. I, I, I just want to thank all of you. We're kind of coming to the end of mm -hmm. today's show. And again, Daryl, uh, Derek rather, yeah. how, well you're helping Daryl, and mm -hmm. Mel, I want to thank both of you for thank you. Thank talking you. to us and uh, kind of sharing with, you, with us some mm -hmm. of your experiences. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah. That's all we have uh, for today. I want to thank uh, again Rick Ford and our guest Mel uh, uh, Wells and Daryl Chapman. You have been watching Tapestry of Life on CCP-TV, Community College of Philadelphia's educational channel. I am Dr. Pascal Scholes, Professor of Behavioral Health and Human Services. See you next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.